views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Hello and welcome to the Social Justice Forums. I am Darren Hyman. Of course, we thank you for joining us. People ask what the Social Justice Forum is all about. Well, a show that actually provides a deeper understanding of the issues and inequities that many people face as well as presenting multiple points of view, and then hopefully getting a deeper understanding, as well as some civic engagement. So stay tuned because the Social Justice Forum starts now. And welcome back everyone. In the wake of this death of George Floyd and the subsequent protests, Black Lives Matter have been out, as well as advocates for the Justice League, in calling for defunding and the dismantling of the New York City Police Department and cutting a billion dollars from the NYPD budget to invest in the education programs, as well as youth services, and a first step towards repairing our community. Now, people are worried that police officers will bring excessive force into the public schools. Also joining us to provide further insight into all of this, the conversation that's going on, is activist and member of the New York City Justice League NYC, Karis Love. And uh, thank you, Karis, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank Good to have, have you. And obviously an important conversation to have. We're talking about the protests that continue to go on day in and day out across the country. Uh, we know that New York City continues to see people taking to the, to the streets. First of all, on the protests themselves. Some people call it effective. Some people say it's ineffective. Your thoughts? Well, if we want to look at um, the history of protesting, I think what we're seeing is uh, a collective. People are collectively coming together. And it's no longer, oh, that's, that's those Black folks' problem over there. That's, that's their problem. Again, the pandemic of COVID-19 has definitely um, open up doors for how folks are protesting right now and we saw not a lot of relief during uh, COVID-19 to those marginalized communities and so everyone is standing up. I want to point out though for the naysayers of protesting although as someone whose grandmother was part of the civil rights movement and a former Black Panther and protesting does work, I want to remind folks that we did pass the repeal of 50A in New York State right around the times when there were protests happening across the city every day. But we have been fighting for the repeal of 50A for many years. And as soon as thousands of people started to hit the streets, they could no longer ignore us. So the protests are working. The emails, the phone calls, they're all working. And when we talk about it working, obviously one of the people, most of the people say, listen, we've seen some reform. We've seen 50A happen. Things have definitely taken place since the protests uh, have gone. Uh, but one of the calls that I talked about in the lead into this particular segment is that of defunding the police department. And you've been very vocal, your organization, I should say, has been very vocal, uh, Black Lives Matter, about defunding the police department. Um, give us your perspective on why, because everybody quite isn't sold on it yet, but give us your perspective. Well, I want to say that I think folks are getting choked up on the word defund. But our schools have been defunded for years and it did not hurt us the way that saying defund the police um, is, is seen to causing a reaction in some people. And this is a national conversation. I'm not sure if folks understand that when we say defund the police, I think people are thinking of, oh, where are the beat cops on my, on my street or who's gonna, uh, respond to when I have real emergencies. Yes, we're talking about the militarized way that we use the uh, police department. Specifically, I'll speak to the NYPD here. The militarized way that we use them, the amount of money that we spend um, militarizing the police, and we need to defund those things. The other thing about defunding the police is if you have more money for uh, programs that impact our setting conditions, healthcare, education, housing, those are all connected to uh, crime and policing. There's a, there's, a, there's a connection between poverty and crime. 
And so if we're not willing to fix the infrastructures of healthcare, education, uh, the cost of living, and all of those things, then we're really going to be at a disadvantage. And we're trying to shift the money away into those areas of uh, education, healthcare, housing, as I said, et cetera, because we are seeing mass unemployment due to the pandemic, but even before, we're seeing mass evictions that are, people are afraid of evictions that are about to happen. We've seen our cost of living go up, but yet we find the money to continue to fund militarized police, but we can't seem to keep the 22,000 jobs that Mayor de Blasio is talking about cutting because he needs to fix the budget. And that to us does not make sense. And, and when you talk about uh, you know, cutting. You talked about putting money towards youth, putting money towards programs. Uh, one of the things that's often talked about in social justice is really breaking that school to prison pipeline. Now, for somebody who may not be familiar, because a lot of people are being educated right now, into what the school to prison pipeline is, first of all, for viewers who may not be familiar, educate on what the school to prison pipeline is. Yeah, absolutely. So we find that our schools, again, it's all comes down to setting conditions, right? The schools and mostly black and brown poor neighborhoods have this school to prison pipeline. These are the schools that do not have enough uh, mental health resources. They don't have counselors. They are, we know that black children are um, not seen as children at a very young age. The suspension rates in black children are higher than those of their white counterparts, even for the same thing. So a black child can have a temper tantrum, and because we have police in our school, no one are in fact policing, which which goes, which is what happens when we get into the get onto the streets. And so we want to see more counselors, not cops, in our schools. Our children are have to, especially now as they're coming back to school. You have the mental health piece being locked up, being in a pandemic, coming from poor neighborhoods with not adequate food, not adequate housing, not adequate uh, healthcare. And then we expect children to sit in the classroom all day and be able to function. And if, you know, emotionally they can't, we call in a, a, a police officer and not a counselor or not a social worker. And that's the difference that we want to see. Um, and we're seeing it across the country, even across our state. Rochester has removed SROs from their schools, and, and we need to see this trend happening because our kids depend on it. These high suspension rates lead to um, getting left back, leads to, you know, um, being labeled as the problem child um, and things of that nature, and that's not what we want, especially not in our schools. That's not what we want. Uh, understood. And when we talk a little bit about what's going on in schools and we talk about uh, the issues that are going on post COVID-19, uh, schools, COVID-19 are going to have to deal with what's called that trauma, right? Yes. I want to talk to about, I want to talk about that for a moment because there is this collective trauma that students are facing and there is this collective trauma that we as a community are facing. And I think that when we see people taking out to protest, in the death of George Floyd, if you see people coming out in mass numbers and ignoring social distancing rules, um, I, I told people, I said, you know, this is also a byproduct of trauma. This is what traumatized people do. They head out, they protest, they take their voice, they take their, they take their action. And in regard, regardless of the fact that social distancing measures are supposed to be in place, people are willing to break that because the trauma has been so intense. Do you agree? Oh, 100%. I also want to point out that we were home, we were sheltering in place, we were social distancing, we were doing all those things. And then as a community, not only were we traumatized by COVID-19 and being, uh, especially the Black community, uh, being part of the community that was dying the most from the, from the, uh, from the virus because of underlying systemic issues, we're home trying to do the right thing, and then we see murder after murder after murder after murder on the screen. And so that is why it's, people are running to the streets, because when we were inside trying to do what everybody else is doing, white supremacy and racism still didn't take a break. It didn't take a break. 
for George Floyd. It didn't take a break for Breonna Taylor. It didn't take a break. And so if we can't even get a break from the, the racism, then we might as well, because we're either going to die from COVID or we're going to die from the racism and, and the state sanctioned uh, murders. And so people are, are, they have nothing else to lose. They're, they're throwing it all on the line. We're trying to make it a better place for uh, our young people coming after us. And we are doing the best we can by wearing masks. You know, I've been at many protests. I'm, I'm, I'm out in the streets probably more now than uh, pre-COVID. We're wearing masks, we're handing out PPEs, we're handing out hand sanitizer. We are trying to do what we can to contain it. But you have to understand that, you know, there's a saying when America uh, gets a, when white people get a cold, black people catch the flu. And we caught the flu with COVID-19, but we're also having to deal with all the other things that are happening in a collective, you know, black people are in a collective trauma right now. Watching our brothers and sisters murdered on a video, and I'm not saying not to record because we do need the evidence. But what I am saying is that it is doing something to black people in America, being able to watch uh, Brianna was sleeping, right? She was in her home, watching us do these everyday things or watching these murders on TV, on these videos, is giving black people a collective trauma. And so if, if, if America really wants to deal with us being out in the streets, then deal with the collective trauma that you have imposed on us. This is a trauma that you've imposed on us since our ancestors were brought here and we're still carrying that around. It's not just now, you know, the protests seem to be super big, but we really are carrying the baton from our, our, our ancestors and our elders before us because there were things that they did not win and we're tired and we need to win them now because we're, we're basically suffocating. But we know that there's a lot of work that's being done on the policy part and that doesn't always get the attention that it should get. We talk a lot about the protests and that's important, but there's also yeah. some great work that's being done on the policy initiative. So with the time that we have, share a little bit about the policy work uh, the Justice League NYC and also uh, movements like Black Lives Matter are engaging in um, that's actually making a difference. Absolutely. You know, there's many tools in our toolbox. And I know that protest is the one that, that we see because it's, it's out front, it's direct action. But before groups like uh, Justice League and, and others, before we go out to protest, we are protesting a, a purpose. So we're trying to accomplish something and it is tied to policy. The reason why is because we have this electoral system, we have this democracy system, and our elected officials, their job is to use the power of the pen to write legislation that undo the systemic oppression that the Black community and many other communities face. And so we are using our right to say, if you are a mayor, a governor, a senator, a assembly person, a city council person, and your job is to pass legislation that makes it to where it's illegal to choke hold someone, it's illegal to put your knee on someone's neck, then that's we're pressuring you. So there's many tools in the toolbox. You might see us out protesting, but we have a team of people, people who follow us, that are sending the emails, that are coming up with the graphics, that are uh, releasing our press release, that are crafting our statements that we're sending to elected officials so they know we're out here, the protest, and we're bringing bodies out because we want you to see that we have people power. And our democracy is built on, on you either have money, there's money in politics, we want to get that out, but right now we have money in politics, money and people power. Our communities tend not to have the money but we have the bodies, we have the people power. And so we're going to use that to pressure policy. And you know, Governor Cuomo said, you got your reform, you got your 50A, you got a few reforms, you can stop marching. And that's pretty hilarious to me because no, we haven't gotten everything that we needed. We do need to defund the police. There needs to be repair, reparations, repair for these communities. And we're not gonna keep going out. So when folks come to us, we say like, listen, yes, you could come out and protest, but this is the next piece. The next piece is that we need to get this petition signed, or the next piece is we need to tweet at the mayor, the governor, to know these are our list of demands, and that's why we were outside. 
Yeah, well, Karis, you know, like Governor Cuomo has just come out recently and said that uh, he's really doing some things about social distancing, possibly slowing up the reopening of phase three here in New York City. And this is what the governor says. He says uh, bars, but then he also says protesters. And um, because protesters aren't social distancing, um, and there'll be some people who make the argument and say, listen, maybe the protest should stop. I mean, you've got 50A, you see a couple of things happen. Um, should the protest stop? And what would your answer be, yes or no? Absolutely not. It's not enough. You know, um, when my grandmother was part of, uh, during the Civil Rights Movement, they got the Voting Rights Act, but voter suppression still happened. You know, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's wild to me that he made those comments because it's, what it says is that you really don't understand the root of white supremacy. These policies are things that we wanted a long time ago. They're actually way overdue. And they're really just, the fact that we even had to have, that we have to talk about why chokehold or putting your knee on the neck of someone is illegal or why we even had to fight and literally fight and physically be on the streets for, to repeal 50A is pretty ridiculous. It's pretty ridiculous that we had to even use our labor for those things, but it hasn't made anything better. Look, there's still this, this issue of too much money in policing. There's too much money in policing and Governor Cuomo has been known since he's been in office to defund, he has been defunding education since his first day in office. And so how much longer are our schools, our communities uh, going to take not having resources and relief so you can have a military, you and Mayor de Blasio can have a militarized police system? No, we're not going to stop. And, and I, would, I would encourage people to don't let him split us. Oh, it's those protesters' fault why we can't get to phase three. It's those protesters' fault why we can't because they're out there protesting. No, because no one was saying that to other groups who, before we even got into these phases, that we're not following directions. We saw the pictures. We saw the pictures downtown of people laying, of people laying on the lawn, not social distancing with masks. We're out here fighting for liberty as equal in the community. So don't put the blame on us. Fix the problem. Right. Right. Well, before we go, let's talk a little bit about what the future holds. Uh, what do you guys have coming up? What do you want people to know? I want people to continue to follow NY Justice League on all platforms, uh, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and Twitter. You know, we just released a statement um, on Friday, I believe, because we have witnessed a string of lynching hanging of black folks and, and, and folks are dismissing it as, oh yes, they were all suicide. And while there were like two families who said it's possible, we, our statement was very clear that this is not a norm in the black community, but however, think about how depressed and stressed we are. Racism is literally stressing us to the point to where if someone did choose that, that is the route that we're taking. And again, here's racism at the underbelly. So I would encourage folks to check out our statement on that. We were, um, follow us, we're doing a lot of work in Long Island with the organizer named Mia Adams on the Akbar uh, Rogers case. And we're not, we're not stopping. I think we got two of our demands. We're not stopping until we get our demands met. Um, we're gonna have protests across the country still. Justice League is not just Justice League NYC, we're Justice League California. Uh, we're a national movement, and we've got a bunch of things coming up. So stay tuned, even digital. Follow us because those who can't get outside, we don't want everyone outside. If you can't, still, please stay safe. But follow our toolkit so you know who to call, so you know who to email, so you know who to tweet at. Well, Karis, we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much for giving us all this information and really uh, bringing perspectives to this uh, social justice forum. Uh, we're going to definitely keep people connected to And thanks for coming and being with us. Thank you so much for having me. All righty. Thank you, Karis. And listen, we want you to stay with us. We do have more show coming up. So please don't go anywhere. The Bronx Social Justice will continue right after this. We know that people are dealing with the health crisis, but there's also a lot of food insecurity. We're giving out healthy food options, and that's what's key here. If you're a senior, you have a disability, they'll actually deliver meals to you. The residents are anxious, they're worried, they're scared, they want to be tested. When things were happening in our community, 
and, and we couldn't get the help. And there's almost a presumption of criminality that, that attaches to your skin color. The site will prioritize those who are at highest risk in the population. If you feel symptoms and you'd like to visit one of these COVID-19 testing sites here in the Bronx, you may call the state health department's hotline. Important to note about this site is no reservations are needed. This is a walk-in clinic. A lot of us are out of work and looking for something to do. We have the machinery and the skills to make large scale of these masks and gowns. Take care of your people. It's going to go way further than we actually can understand. Right now, employees like myself are just adjusting to the new reality. With coronavirus spreading, people at higher risk must take extra precautions. You're at higher risk if you're over 65 or if you have an underlying medical condition. Please visit coronavirus.gov for more information. And welcome back. Well, protests continue to spread across this nation in the wake of the death of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis, Minnesota police officers. And Brotherhood Sister Soul is an organization who is locally based with the national reach. Talking more about them, they're an evidence-based program that serves young people, and they come from economically poor communities and organize and advocate for social change. And in a world that is unforgiving sometimes towards people of color, well, the organization provides them the knowledge and the confidence to succeed, educating them about the history, and also encourages every person to develop a clear understanding of the principles that they stand for. Joining us now to talk a little bit more about this is the executive director and co-founder of Brotherhood Sisterhood Soul, uh, Kari Laz Lazar White. And I'll pronounce it again, Kari Lazar White. And we thank you so much, Kari, for being with us. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Look forward to talking with you. Yeah. So uh, for people who aren't familiar with the organization, first, why don't you just give us a little bit of an acquaintance to the organization? Sure. Uh, Brotherhood Sister Soul is now in our 25th year. Um, we have been doing work for now a quarter of a century. Um, we really work in three different spaces. It's comprehensive youth development work, uh, helping young people develop a moral and ethical code, who they are as young men and young women. What does it mean to be leaders and change makers? You know, we aspire to do the, the work of SNCC, but today, right, to politicize young people, to be organizers, to be activists. And there's a lot of direct service that's a part of that from month-long international study programs in Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean, um, college guidance, workforce development, but also training young people to be community organizers. Uh, in addition to that, we train uh, educators across the country on our model, helping them to implement what we do uh, in their home communities. And then we work to change uh, conditions. We work to affect policy. We organize every day around issues having to do with uh, criminal justice, policing, environmental justice issues, and uh, educational access as well. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about getting youth active and really social justice, social action, something that you guys have been doing for a very, you know, for a very long time. Talk to me about how do you address the times such as now? When we look at, you know, the death of George Floyd, uh, you know, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, um, and all of us had an opportunity to see this in living, in living color, live in living color on video. Um, walk us through a little bit about what happened from there with you guys as an organization. I mean, I think the reality of being black in this country is that, you know, the, the names, as horrific as those recent three names are, they are on a long list of a much longer list of names. And so in our 25 years of Brotherhood Sister Soul, we've been out in the streets organizing, protesting, and marching uh, when, you know, Abner Louima was assaulted, when Amadou Diallo was killed, when Sean Bell was killed, um, when Patrick Dorisman was killed. Um, you know, when you go down the list and... You know, even the last words now of George Floyd um, echo the same last words of Eric Gardner. I mean, now, now you're in this situation where the result of state police violence against black and brown bodies is something we've been protesting since our founding. Um, it's about young people organizing. It's about young people creating art that speaks out around these issues, documentaries, uh, writing songs about it, creating exhibits about it. It's about our young people testifying in front of the city council and state legislative bodies about police violence. 
Uh, it's working to shut Rikers Island. It's working to raise the age in New York until last year, New York being one of only two states that would prosecute children as adults. So all these issues are interconnected. The police are only one part of this kind of disparate uh, racial, racialized and racist effect of the criminal justice system. And our young people were very involved, for instance, in the effort to counter the widespread use of stop and frisk in the city. Uh, one of our alumni members, Nicholas Pert, wrote an op-ed that went viral, including in the New York Times, called Why is the NYPD After Me? And it was just a story mm -hmm. of one young black man in Harlem and what that experience was like. And so, unfortunately, these recent killings um, have not changed our work because we've been a racial equity, racial justice uh, organization for 25 years. It's just yet again brought our youth organizers out activa activating, organizing, and agitating. And talk to us about youth organizers. And they're in the forefront of this vo and having a voice and really being vocal. And they're doing a job that many of us say, you know, should have been done by older people, but yet and still they're out there, they're on the front line. Give me a little bit about youth activism and how your organization really uh, helps to shape that and, and really mold that in some form. Well, first, I, mean, I think there's two points on that. First is that young people have always been at the forefront of youth uh, of movements. There's always been youth organizers as a part of social change movements in this country, you know, broadly, whether it was the anti-Vietnam War protests that brought down a president, the women's movement, the LGBTQ movement, so many movements. But very essentially in the, in the Black community, in terms of the civil rights movement and the Black power movement, young people have always been at the forefront. You know, Reverend Martin Luther King was 25 years old when he led the Montgomery bus boycott. It was teenagers who were freedom riders leaving historically black colleges and universities to get on freedom buses. It was young people who were part of SNCC. I mean, those were the lessons of Ella Baker and Bayard Rustin and people like that, that young people had to be centered to the movement. And so that's our view. Our view is that young people aren't, you know, the leaders down the road in the future. They're leaders right now. And so they're doing all the things that I've talked about. Um, I also, though, think it's important that we see the organizing of young people today within the context of black radical movements in this country, uh, which have always been here. So this idea that somehow young people today are doing the work that we should have done or three generations ago should have done is actually something I push back on because I think the history of black people in this country is a history of revolt. It's a history of organizing. It's a history of agitation. And we can go through every single generation and see people who are doing that work. Clearly now it's culminating with social media, with numbers, with coverage, with a more diverse marching base, if you will. Um, but people have been brave and protesting and organizing and fighting you know, since we arrived here. And I think it's important to see the organizing today within that context, context historically. Um, and it's a part of a, a freedom-loving Black revolt context. Yeah. Economic inequality. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you, but economic inequality is also big. When we talk about a lot of the challenges that, uh, that we're trying to overcome with systemic racism, um, and those conversations are now being had. We start to hear uh, organizations now who are actually uh, giving back. I, I know Netflix gave $40 million to uh, Morehouse College. Uh, it doesn't uh, eradicate economic inequality, but let's have that conversation about economic inequality. What do you see? And... Um, how do you see us uh, really addressing that? Again, I mean, I think you have to start with the realities and history of this nation. You know, this is a country that's been built on stolen land by stolen labor. Uh, that's the reality of economic development in this country. Um, and, you know, reparations were never paid for that labor. Um, and post-slavery, there also was the intentional state-sponsored destruction of black wealth. Um, that we saw all across the country from Rosewood to Tulsa, but also in terms of redlining, in terms of keeping government benefits from Black people having access to that, whether it was welfare or Social Security or the GI Bill or building a home. And so, you know, I think when we, we operate within a system like that, there is no way to separate racial inequality and economic inequality because they go hand in hand and have since the founding of the country. And you know, you look at the last three months or so, you have 40 million people unemployed in this country. Uh, you have low-income people catching hell economically, uh, disproportionately black and brown, but low-income people of all backgrounds. And, you know, over nearly 600 billionaires have made untold billions of dollars during this time. It's only deepened the economic difference in this country. And so the fact that companies are putting up for their proceeds relatively small amounts of money 
Um, it is important that there are more partners in this work if they are going to truly stand up and contribute. But I don't think we should also be um, distracted by, you know, a mere change of the, of the drapes and think that we're really moving the room around. I don't think that there are really the resources on the table from a government perspective and certainly from a private wealth perspective that should be appropriate to respond to this kind of inequity. It seems like at this point really window dressing. Well, amidst racial, I mean, economic inequity, uh, you know, one of the things that's being called for right now and kind of like bringing some justice is to talk about defunding police. Now, there's some people who are really adverse to that word, defunding the police. Some people feel as though that police need is every dollar that they can get. But give me your take on when we talk about defunding the police. What does that look like for you and what would you like to see? So the Brother and Sister Soul has worked with and partnered with Communities for Police Reform for about seven years now. And that's a coalition of social justice organizations throughout the city that led the effort to push back against Stop and Frisk. And that's groups like, you know, Legal Defense Fund and Center for Constitutional Rights, Make the Road New York, you know, so many organizing groups that do critical work. So I think it's really important when you start talking about defunding the police that everyone's clear on what that means. Uh, the call is to reduce the NYPD's funding from $6 billion a year to $5 billion a year. It's a cut of 16% at a time of great economic distress in the city. So the call isn't to remove all funding from the NYPD. There are many in favor of that, but that's not what actually the defunding movement is about. It's about a reduction of 16%. And what that looks like is in 2021, if the defund movement is successful, instead of having 37,000 police officers, there'll be 34,000 police officers. So everybody has to take a step back and realize that what this approach is, is actually, I would say, not aggressive enough in terms of what we really need to do to rein in widespread um, aggressive racial policing in the city. And instead, what you want to do is shrink the footprint of the police. The police don't need to be called for so many calls that they receive. And actually, police departments across the country have said they themselves don't want to be called for these issues. Whether right. it's a dog, whether it's a homeless person who needs social services and not the police, whether it's a car alarm, whether it's truancy, all these things are not times that you need the police call whether it's marijuana or an open container. You know, there are violence interrupters in the city who have done a better job at decreasing violence. If you shrink the footprint and you say the police will not be called when you actually need social services called, then the police can concentrate theoretically on their very low clear rate. Nationally, 40% of rapes and murders are solved. So maybe focus on those issues and not broken windows policing which disproportionately affects black and brown people and not have the police respond to situations that quite honestly, they're not trained to respond to, whether mm -hmm. that's a mental health emergency or a truant young person. The police have no business there and they have no business in our schools, which is a collateral issue as well, that the NYPD manages over 5,000 personnel in our schools. And that's, that's a recent thing. I mean, I grew up in the city. When I went to elementary school, there were no police in the schools. This, this happened in the late 1990s. So, the idea that we need police personnel in our schools is recent, unfounded, and inappropriate. And so, so that's another example yeah. of a change that we would want. Let me jump in and ask the question here about this, because many times what happens is you do have police and they're responding to calls and they're being involved, but there's a great partnership that's formed with community called Community Partners, community-based organizations. And is it possible? I mean, I think so. That it's possible that you can partner with some of these organizations to try to mitigate some of the things that the police department is actually doing. I mean, I grew up with uh, my own form of community policing was called the Police Athletic League. Uh, we had community policing with Officer Friendly, who was walking around um, and had a great relationship with those people who were in the community. We know that. Um, and those, you know, I mean, granted, it was a few years ago, a few, few, but they were successful, possibly a reemergence of these things in a, in, a, in a newfound form. So obviously, we want police officers to engage with the community. Uh, you call it officer friendly. We certainly want them to live up to, you know, the mantra of protect and serve, right? They are here because we pay their salaries. They are here to protect and to serve. And so we certainly want them to adhere to that and to be the officer friendly of your childhood. I think the question is whether we want the police to do things again that they are not trained to do and are not the types of interactions we want. So actually they're not trained to do youth development work. 
Um, so I would not want to see basketball leagues and youth development run by the police because we know just this year, this administration has tried to put in place an additional youth police force that in their own words would track young people. We don't need our young people criminalized. We don't need our young people tracked. We don't need any of that. We need youth development workers and educators working with young people who are trained to do that, not police personnel. And so I think those are two separate issues. How you engage with the community, yes. But on the other side, I don't think we want an expansion of the police being involved in essentially social services. It's not their job, and they've proven not to be good at it. Let me move along and ask you a little bit to talk about programming. Yeah, you have a liberation program. So please educate our viewers a little bit about the liberation program. So this is a space for young people who you know, want to change the world. I mean, that's the beauty of young people is that faith, that passion, that commitment to do that kind of work. They go through a, a liberation school over the summer where they learn the history of social organizing and activism and the role of young people in those movements. But they also learn about many of the key Kind of spaces of organizing today um, and the important issues so that they have the data and the information and the background. They go through multiple years of training with us um, and then they put that into action. And you know, one of the main issues that they've worked on at the Liberation Program in our organization has been the fact that currently there's approximately one social worker or guidance counselor for 400 young people in our public schools. And that's an aggregate. In certain schools, it's one to 1,500. You know, that means that young people are not getting the mental health support they need. That means that young people aren't getting the guidance that they need. It means when young people are going through trauma, they don't have someone to speak to. And that's happening in low-income black and brown communities. At the same moment, again, we have over 5,000 NYPD personnel in the school. So the argument is, let's decrease the amount of security in a school, which shouldn't be managed by the police, but there may be some amount of security in a school, and let's increase nurse practitioners, social workers, guidance counselors, people to really support young people. And last year, the New York City Council increased by $285 million funding to hire more of those types of counselors. It's not enough because the system is so large, but it certainly was a win. And people like public advocate Jamani Williams, Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, um, and our young people uh, that are part of a citywide youth campaign really organized for that. And I think that's a quintessential example of youth power, but also about where you put your resources. And a budget is a moral document. And if you're choosing to spend more money on security and policing in our schools than you are on mental health and on counseling, then that speaks to your priorities. And so what we're trying to do is change the narrative and change the priorities. Yeah. Before we leave, I want to get you an opportunity to tell people how they can get connected to Brotherhood, Sisterhood, Soul. Um, and, you know, the, you've already talked a little bit about the services that you provide, but how can they get connected and what do you have coming up? So Brotherhood, Sister Soul works with young people from the ages of eight until 22. Um, you can go to our website at uh, www.brotherhood-sister-soul, and soul is S-O-L, dot org. You can find out about all of our programmings. Young people can join our organization. Uh, we always are recruiting and serving more young people. We look for mentors. We look for people to help us in our work. And since the advent of COVID, we have now provided 30,000 meals uh, in our community and to our young people. And so we also need donations and support to keep that work going. And so whether you wanna make a financial contribution, mentor, um, get involved with our young people, or whether you wanna become one of the youth members of GrowSys, you can find out more information at that URL. Wow. Well, thank you so much. Kari Lazar White, thank you so much. He's the executive director and co-founder of the Brotherhood Sister Soul. And thank you so much for being with us here on our show. We definitely appreciate hearing your voice. Got to have you back. And maybe we'll get some of these young people here to also talk to us as well. That would be wonderful. I'd love to have Liberation Program young people or staff come on together and talk with you. I think they'd love it. And thank you for having me on today. Hey, thank you. No, and we love it too. So we're going we're gonna to call that a deal. All right. So, uh, Stay, stay right there. Listen, I want to take a quick break, come back with some more show. Be with us. Well, I'll say we'll be back in just a few minutes right after this. When taking public transportation, don't touch your phone. Carry hand sanitizer and use it immediately upon leaving the bus or train. Avoid touching your face. If someone is coughing or sneezing, move away. Wash your hands with soap and water as soon as possible. Limit contact with poles. If possible, avoid rush hour. Don't eat or drink on public transportation. 
Keep your bag off the floor or other surfaces. Avoid directly touching turnstiles. Stay up to date with the latest from your local health department and CDC. Why should young people care about the spread of coronavirus? Well, we know that people with underlying medical conditions over the age of 60 are at highest risk, but they've got to get it from somebody. So we're asking everyone to be selfless for others so that we can protect those who are most susceptible. Not going to bars, not going to restaurants. It all just means physical separation so that you have a space between you and others. For more information on how you can social distance, please go to coronavirus.gov. of color are consistently facing different challenges, assaults on voting rights, a renewed undermining of the equal access to quality education, as well as the reversal of the criminal justice system, as well as policing reform. Well, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and the Educational Fund is the country's first and foremost civil and human rights law firm. LDF's mission is to achieve racial justice, equality, and promote an inclusive society. And here to provide her point of view on this matter, I'm joined by the Policy Council of NAACP's Legal Defense and Educational Fund Incorporated, Katura Tops. And Katura, thank you so much for joining us here. Of course, thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Glad to have you. Um, and so listen, I, I, I shared throughout the course of this show that when we talk about social justice, it's not really just about protest, but it really is also about dealing with policy. So a little bit about what the NAACP does uh, and their Legal Defense Fund in addressing those issues of policy. Yeah, so actually, you know, this moment, what makes it so unique is that we are actually addressing this on all different levels. So we're responding in litigation and um, policy with organizing with folks on the ground and so on our policy side a lot of what you'll see is us specifically looking at different legislation we've been very implemental and in, um, making sure that any sort of reforms that are coming out through congress or any bills that are being passed have our input to make sure that we are highlighting the community's concerns at this moment um, our policing reform campaign has been very implemented influential in making sure that we're tracking all of these injustices that are happening, um, being able to support communities on the ground, helping to promote different policy changes and legislative changes that will push for long-term changes rather than, uh, you know, short, quick reforms that I think a lot of people are used to and, and are hoping that would pacify communities right now. Yeah. And so we talk about some of the work that's being done, of course, addressing the issue of racial injustice. And of course, that's why we're seeing people on the streets. That's why we're seeing people take to the airwaves, uh, the quest for racial injustice. This is, or I should say racial justice. Uh, but talk to us about where you are today uh, amidst all this happening with the social unrest and uh, what's happening with social justice. Yeah, you know, I think that it's a lot of different things, right? I think right now the country is sort of shocked. A lot of people who have deliberately turned a blind eye to black injustice in this country, right? To anti-black racism, that's, people have turned a blind eye to that and now they're sort of being confronted with it, with it in a way that they can't. And so we're seeing people on the ground protesting, we're seeing marches, but we're also seeing communities working to say, actually, this time we won't be silenced. We won't be, um, you know, we won't be sort of 
allowed to sit in the corner and say, okay, this is where we're going to accept the status quo again. We are actually seeing communities stand up and say, we're working to dismantle those systems that have that racial injustice. And so that, that's hitting across all sections. We're seeing that in education, we're seeing it in housing, we're seeing that um, in the criminal legal system, not just in policing and bail reform. And so a lot of these things, you know, I'd be remiss if I made it seem like all of this was new. This really isn't new. These things have been happening for you know decades. Black communities have been crying out for this and pushing for these changes that we want to see. And it's just now that the world is sort of turning an eye and looking and seeing what's happening. Um, and I think it's important that whenever we talk about this moment, we put the historical context of racism into context, whatever, whatever we're saying, but we also put into context the current crisis that black families are experiencing in America. That's COVID, that's racism, that's economic stress, that's in access to resources. And so all of those things have combined to this moment that we're in right now. What are you seeing on your end with regards to allies, right? Because I think, you know, you, there's a lot of support from the white community uh, in terms of dealing with the issues that we're seeing right now. Um, that's what a lot of people say when we compare it to the 60s. The 60s had some support uh, with the death of George Floyd, Amar, Ahmaud Arbery, uh, Breonna Taylor, people are getting ready. People are seeing this on videotape and saying, "Listen, um, I'm not waiting. I'm I'm really jumping in, and I'm and I'm I'm applying some assistance." So, from your perspective, talk to us about uh, what you're seeing and the work that you're doing, and how the support continues to come. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you brought that up because the, the support is critical. You know, we we've seen an influx of support. Um, we have seen lots of organizations reaching out to us, wanting to help, wanting to donate. We've seen lots of allies, and I think that's powerful. I think that's absolutely great. But what I've been saying to allies is, um, first and foremost, remember that this is a movement and not a moment. Like, this right. is not something that can be a fad for the moment, and that'll seem cool, and we all change our social medias to you know, have a black box and say Black Lives Matter, and then in a few months, we forget this and then continue on. This is not something that black communities are going to forget. This is not something that we're gonna lie down easily and accept, less, accept the status quo about. So for allies hoping to be engaged in this moment, I say really come into it understanding the history, the context and understanding that if you're going to be a part of this, folks are gonna be looking for you to actually do the work. And that work does, um, it, work, it looks differently in a variety of contexts for a variety of allies. But, um, you know, we, we see racism, as I said, in every area. So the first thing that allies can do is, is look, look around you, right? If, if you're a real estate agent, then you can start to address racism in real estate. If you're, you know, a social worker, if you're in housing, like it, it, basically any area, you, you can use that as an opportunity to look around and say, how can I support? And then finally, I would say making sure that allies understand that this is a moment to uplift Black lives and uplift Black voices. This is not a moment for allies to monopolize the conversation, to try to jump in and dictate what Black people are feeling, what is right or versus wrong. We don't need nuanced discussions about whether something should have been looted or not. We're focusing on the larger picture and so we need allies who are going to step into that role and say, I'm here to support Black lives in any way that I can. Yeah, yeah. Important, important for us to have that understanding and that perspective when it comes to allies. I think that allies mm -hmm. are making a lot of uh, significant progress in terms of coming on board. But mm -hmm. certainly, as you said, about a moment, not just capitalizing on the moment, but really being connected and involved uh, to the movement. I know one of the things that's been a movement for a long time is that of police reform. Uh, you guys have been very busy and on the front lines talking about police reform. My question throughout the course of the last couple of weeks to those who've been listening is, what is your uh, response to 50A? Now that 50A has been signed uh, into law by the governor, particularly here in New York, uh, your thoughts? Yeah, you know, 50A, you can't talk about it. I can't talk about it without smiling because it. Yeah. we have to acknowledge it's, it was a huge win, right? Like 50A is a historic win for New York and 50A was not by itself. 50A was one um, bill that was passed in a suite of bills that was um, called the, New, the Safer New York Act. And so that package had about five bills in it and four of those bills were passed. And so those were all connected to policing reform and making sure that uh, New York is safer for black and brown folks who are over-policed. And so it's absolutely great, but if we wanna just go back to 50A, you know, 
within that victory also comes the acknowledgement that 50a is really a common sense or the repeal of 50a let me let me be clear mm -hmm. the repeal of 50a is really a common sense law like it is it is a very simple basic common sense law it simply applies the standard of transparency and public accountability to police officers that we see in many other professions so that is sort of an indication of how it, it's it's a big win, but it really shouldn't have been, right? Like communities on the ground have been fighting for a repeal of 50A for years. And we saw the most egregious situations happen around 50A. And we saw officers hide behind 50A, who the department itself, the NYPD itself said, these officers had create, you know, had um, engaged in egregious conduct, but we're still going to hide them and cloak them in secrecy. We saw that and that still wasn't enough for that law to be repealed. And so when I think about that, I think about why people right now are so resistant to any sort of piecemeal efforts of reform. People want to dismantle this entire system that allows the sort of constant, repetitive, systemic injustices to happen. Because if you don't, then you find yourself in a situation where you're fighting for years to repeal something as simple as 50A. I want to ask you this question. Um, you know, we're talking about the governor. Uh, the governor has definitely made his point to say, listen, with uh, the repeal of 50A, that's been a great thing. Uh, but as far as protesters, I know that he's talked a lot about protesters with regards to social distancing, what's going on, almost alluding to like, hey, uh, you know, you got a couple of wins here. Let's ease up on the protesting. Let's ease up on social distancing. You know, from your perspective, how do you see that? And how would you, how, how, what message would you like to send? Well, I mean, that's ridiculous to start, first of all. Like, like I said, I mean, these are very big reforms in the context of communities that have been fighting for the simplest things for a long time, but they're in, in no way going to stop or prevent or alter or dismantle the systems that allow policing to be what it is today. And it's especially coming from a governor who's in, who's in New York, which has the largest police department in the country, right? And has repetitive, egregious misconduct, racially discriminatory misconduct, right? This is the same department that did stop and frisk and, and, and justified itself all the way up until the Supreme Court, right? This is the same department where when social distancing enforcement was happening, we saw officers deliberately going into black and brown communities and brutally beating and, and, and inflicting police violence on people because they didn't wear a mask or because they weren't social distancing when the very officers themselves weren't. And then that same department was passing out masks and protective equipment to white neighborhoods. So to, to trivialize the experiences of black and brown communities, especially in New York and say that, hey, we threw you a small win. We threw you just the most basic level of decency where police officers are just beginning to start to be accountable to the public where there's a little bit of transparency between this department that's absolutely ridiculous and i'll just note as well like you know we all understand that the nypd is still not very transparent like right. 50a is going to allow us to have access to more than we did before but it's still extremely difficult we have no idea what sort of surveillance technology the, the department is using. We have no idea um, how they're interacting with our data. We have no idea what the department is doing on a constant basis. And so to say that we the department is giving something really small, which was actually not the governor's doing, this was communities doing. This was communities organizing and fighting and pushing for this and saying, you're not gonna stop until you hear us. I mean, a powerful moment for me was being on Twitter and seeing repeal 50A trending on Twitter for two days and mm. seeing Mariah Carey tweet repeal 50A. And I'm like, you know, this is something I've been testifying about. This is something we've been writing about. It's, it's shocking to see it. So we were obviously surprised and excited, but, but I only use that example to say that was a community effort. That wasn't because the governor stepped up and decided to do this on its own. Yeah. Yeah. I want to ask you about how do we achieve justice? I mean, obviously that's the big question right mm -hmm. now. Um, trying to get justice, equality, and not really equality, let's be honest, it's not about equality, it's about equity. So, so how do we get equity and justice from your perspective? That's a very big question. Ah. Very loaded question. Um, I think I would first start 
you know, those words mean different things to a lot of different people. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I am cautious about throwing those terms out because a lot of times we see things that are so clearly not justice or equality or equity for, for black people and, and they're pushed and labeled as that. Um, to sort of, again, pacify us and continue on with the status quo. So I think if we are to get to any sort of area where this country actually acknowledged and valued Black lives and treated them the way that they should be treated, um, the first thing we would have to do is see a great acknowledgement of what's happened. Like, you know, I think our country is able to say, yes, we all can agree that slavery happened. But beyond that, there really isn't an acknowledgement of the generations of trauma, of harm, of economic deprivation, um, of, of separation. There, there really isn't an acknowledgement of that and how those things have all sort of led to this moment. There isn't even an acknowledgement that policing derived from slave patrols, that very much the concept of monitoring and surveilling black lives is exactly what we see today. But you know, that our country hasn't done that yet. We haven't done down and dug and did that work. Um, this is a country that will, you know, look at economically struggling black communities and say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, completely ignoring the fact that black communities have repeatedly over and over built themselves up only to have this country take it away that redlining still exists that housing discrimination still exists that you know all of these things are still here and that's not even including the criminal legal system um so i think first there would need to be some some deep acknowledgement of what's happening we're starting to see that we're starting to see people pull down statues but we're not seeing uh, you know state leaders stand up and say that statue is coming down and it should have never been put up and when it was put up it was racist and that was a racist thing that happened like we're not seeing that we're not seeing the acknowledgement of the real consequences that happened from that and so i think if we can get that first step that'd be great and then next is going to take really dismantling all of these systems i mean you you have to stop and think how can we actually say that black lives matter when you know we constantly support systems that target and harm and and end black lives and that's that's an across the board so the, a lot of those systems no those systems will have to be dismantled they'll have to be a serious look at not how can we reform them and make meaningful changes here and there but how can we completely eradicate those systems and build again and then finally, I think we're gonna need a completely new vision of what public safety means. Mm -hmm. We have to reimagine what that looks like. We have to acknowledge that public safety right now is public safety mostly for white people and not for black and brown communities. We have to acknowledge that whiteness has been constantly weaponized against black people and find ways to deal with that. And so before we do all of that hard work, we're in this moment. Yeah. And we're just, we're just starting. We're just at the beginning. And so that's why I was so adamant of saying, if you're an ally, that's fantastic. But it, this is a long fight. And it's going to take a lot, of, a lot of work and a lot of support. Yeah. Just don't let it be a, mo a moment, but be a part of the movement. Katura, thank you so much. We're going to have to leave it there. But thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All right, Tour Tops here with us as well. Well, listen, I want to let you know as we are here now, we come to the end of our show today. I want to thank all of you for joining us. I want to thank our guests too for joining us and being here on the Bronx Social Justice Forums. Now, if you want to rewatch the next episode, or I should say this week's episode, you can catch the Recablecast right here on Bronx this channel. 67 Verizon Files Channel 33 or anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. We will come back to you next week with some brand new information, uh, new discussions, and new topics as we continue to talk about social justice. For all of us here on the show, I'm Darren Jaime saying take care. God bless. We'll talk to you soon. It's been real.